Uh, just a quick check to see audio work. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Excellent. I'll just get a coffee and then uh, we'll be ready. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, right. Uh, Natasha, can you hear me now? I was just downstairs getting a coffee to get ready. I can just uh, hear your message. I can't hear anything. Uh, how was the cat feeling after this morning shenanigans? Uh, I don't know. She, she does this crazy thing where she goes outside and um, she eats grass. And then sometimes it's okay and sometimes... Um, she just starts vomiting like crazy, and uh, she had a she had a bit of a fit, and I had to clean up the carpet here. But uh, it, it's just, and you can see the stuff that comes out is just uh, from the grass she's been eating. But um, here we go, you know, <laughs> life with a cat. Uh, yeah, she's now next next door. She's um, it's been in the window, just uh, making sure that everything is, is okay outside and she's been following all the cars and on the road and uh, uh, so I'm not doubt she'll probably come around. She, she always gets a bit sort of irritated when I talk into this weird thing and I'm not really talking to her so that's, uh, um, I'm sure she'll come around <laughs> during the session. Just make sure that everything is okay here, checking on everything. Okay, hope you have had a good lunch break. Just checking the microphone. Um, I hope you can hear me. So. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome on the updates. Yeah. Um, I don't think she will learn. No, she's done it many times. She's really, I don't know what it is, whether they get addicted to grass. I'm trying to figure out what this grass thing is all about. 
or whether they, you know, it's part of the process that they need to do it to clear their stomachs or, or not sure. But when she goes outside straight to some grass and she's chomping away, <clears throat> and I said, so sometimes it's okay. And sometimes it's just, uh, uh, the, uh, you can hear her and, um, uh, she's, uh, yeah, you can hear her and um, she's uh, she's getting sick and then I'm getting ready with uh, the precious toilet paper. The precious toilet paper. By the way, I, I managed to get some toilet paper this morning. I was really proud of myself. And I thought, you know, what a day, you know, I got I got toilet paper. Yeah. Never thought that I would ever think that way, but uh, I did this morning. Um, the last couple of days when I was looking, everything was gone here. Everything was gone. Oh, Aaron, um, good. Thank you for the update. Your cat was eating grass and apparently it is to clear their stomach. Uh, do they, um, is it normal for them to, to vomit? Is it part of their routine? Should I keep her outside a little bit longer so that she will vomit outside rather than inside? What a day, yeah. I, I thought it was like Christmas, yeah. I'd been looking for, for days and the shelves were empty. Every shop I went, you couldn't get you, you couldn't you couldn't get bog rolls or what was the other bit? Um pasta. No pasta either. It's no rice, no pasta, no bog rolls, and canned food was very, very rare as well. Okay, uh, hi Sarah. Uh, yeah, 310. We, we're still going to carry on with 310. There's a couple of lectures to go. I think it's two after this, then the uh, exam preparation. And then we are done with 310. It's just the exam then at the end of it. But. Um, my suggestion is when <clears throat> when you come back, um, we'll have another session on the exam prep. Um, and um, and then we'll um, we'll let you do the exam. Uh, whenever that that's going to be, probably the next time you come back in. Um, but we're going to go through the exam prep before, so you know what to expect and you know how the course relates to the exam and and everything else. <clears throat> okay, we've got, what's the time? Two more minutes to go. We've got 14 people here. Okay, we'll maybe just wait a couple of more minutes and then we'll make a start. So, Josh said every day is a Whopper day. I, I missed um, a Whopper Wednesday, I have to say. I was uh, a little bit miffed about that. So, no Whopper on a Wednesday from Burger King. Okay. Uh, hi, Josh. Right. Um, what else? We've got just a couple of minutes and then we'll make a start on this. Right. <clears throat> Let me just turn off the radio next door.
Right, um, <clears throat> let's make a start. So um, this talk is very similar to the talk we had before. Probably won't take us long. Um, lots of slides, lots of pictures, but uh, we'll make it sweet, short and painless. And then we are uh, done and dusted with the, um, with the whole thing about pumps. The next talk is probably a little bit more interesting. We're going to look at pipelines and pipes and how to clean them out and, and things like that. And um, um, this talk is pretty much just all about pumps. And in this instance, we're just going to look at uh, uh, gas, uh, gas transfer uh, and using pumps for doing that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, Fash, it's a new lesson. It's unit 4.5, yeah. It's uh, before we were talking pumps and shafts, so that's all about pumps and shafts, and now it's uh, pumps and transferring gases. Okay, anyway, let's make a start. So it's unit 4.5, um, or criteria, sorry, unit um, 310, 310, thermodynamics, and unit and criteria 4.5. Yeah. Got this um, wrong. Uh, right, let me just go on here. Ah, yeah, you can see as well, you know, you can see the... Um, interaction, a little piston going up and down. Anyway, let's go through this. Um, some animated graphics here. Uh, at the end of the lesson, lesson, you will know and you will understand fundamental differences between different types of pumps used for moving gases. So um, we're going <clears> to, <throat> pretty much the same as before. Um, Oh, we use it, we look, look at different pumps, but, but in this instance, it's not about liquids, it's all about gases. Um, one thing you have to sort of bear in mind with, uh, with gases is that uh, liquids do not compress, gases do. Yeah. So um, the, when we use pumps, it's um, slightly different because we have to, to look at um, the way gases or gas can compress and, um, and, and will respond to pressure in a certain way. Uh, so what we look at um, is um, we go a little bit more into some of the, the different pump types. We're going to look at uh, reciprocating piston type pumps, uh, rotary blowers, uh, vein and lobe, centrifugal blowers. And then we've got, again, stuff which you don't use for liquids. It's uh, radial flow and axial, axial flow funds, and then also at multi-stage units. Yeah. And so that's um, you know everything we're going we're gonna to look at. And um, again, it's going to be um, a little bit of repetition. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try and stay well below one hour, so it shouldn't be too long. Uh, so we've got a couple of gas pumps you can see here. And these pumps on those pictures, they are exclusively made for, for the use with uh, gases. Um, uh, one is, I can see one is uh, CO2 gas, and uh, what, what is the other one is for uh, oil and gases, and so on. So let's go through. Describe when you would need to pump gas or air. And uh, we've got a couple of scenarios here. We've got uh, an air compressor, you know, makes perfect sense. So if you've got a, uh, you know, like for your tire, for example, on your car, you try to pump them up, you will have a, a little compressor. You remember in the classroom, I had my, uh, my little multi-unit with a compressor, which I actually accidentally turned on. Uh, I don't know whether it was in your class or the other class, but uh, there's a small air compressor in there. I used to sort of charge it up in, during class time. And, and that's just an air compressor, box standard air compressor. Uh, we are pumping domestic gas. Uh, we've got gas pipelines as well. And obviously, uh, to pump gas or to push gas through a pipeline, um, some pumping action is required. We've got air conditioning. Even though the refrigerant in the air conditioning unit you know, may be a vapor and a liquid, and it sort of goes from one stage to another, uh, but we've also got um, you know, fans which blow air um, through the air conditioning unit um, to either cool or heat up a room. Uh, generally for climate control, then we've got heating systems. Uh, car ventilation is one example, which you probably come across every day. So you've got some funds sitting in your car and, and all you're doing is, is, is effectively pumping gas, uh, in this instance, air, uh, through a matrix, through a heated matrix. And so you get uh, uh, hot air. Uh, what else have we got? We've got a, a wind tunnel, you know, used for design purposes. Um, or for, for testing. And then uh, we've also got pneumatic systems. Yeah. So again, we need to generate pressure. Normally, we've got an air compressor and uh, some some tanks, some reservoir system. We, we pressurize the system, put a lot lots of air in there, and then um, uh, we, we use pneumatic air pressure 
for driving actuators and things like that. Okay, first of all, to, to generate the pressure, we've got the uh, reciprocating piston type pump, and that's, uh, I, at a guess, I mean, if I were a betting man, which I'm not, or not really, uh, but if I were to take the little compressor, the little red compressor, which you may have seen when I took it in the class, if, you, if I were to take it apart, um, that's most likely the type of, comp um, the type of uh, um, pump I would find in there. Uh, and again, you see uh, the two valves. It's just a very simplified version. Uh, so you've got a, a, an inlet valve down here. So when it pulls back, air is sucked in. And when this piston goes forward, um, the air will seal this valve and open the top valve, and the air is pushed out. And that's pretty much how the, um, the, pump, the pump works. A problem with these pumps is what tends to go is um, either the valves, or you've got some mechanical components here, and they after some time, they just break. Uh, I had a couple of uh, compressors for my car, and um, uh, they all, after some time, if you use them quite frequently, um, after some time they just go. And, um, and and where you see the mouse, like those mechanical links that tend to be the, the, the first ones to go. Right, a little animated picture. Hope you can enjoy it. Uh, I'll leave it on for a little bit. Um, and you can see how this works. So you've got uh, the two valves. Uh, you've got the suction valve, which is down here. Yeah, and then you've got the, the discharge valve, which is here. Yeah. Isn't it pretty? Anyway, I hope it makes sense. Um, and uh, you get like a rough idea of how, how this works. So that's a reciprocating, try again, reciprocating piston type pump. Uh, a little bit of a tongue twister there, but um, it's uh, that's how they work. Yeah? And that's, again, sort of small car compressors, you know, air compressors for cars, for car tires. Um, and I guess I would say probably a lot of, you know, stuff for pneumatics and things like that. Um, when you've got a compressor, uh, they would work the same way. Uh, my brother, he is a, a professional car mechanic, and he um, sort of gets all these professional tools, and he's got one... Uh, compressor and it looks like a small um, almost like a small motorbike engine and it's just like a little piston inside and it works exactly on this, this principle so it's got a small electric motor you turn it on uh, the piston kicks in and it sort of comes uh, in and out in and out and you can hear it you can hear the piston it's quite noisy as well and um, and it uh, builds up the pressure in a small tank and and you can then blow up a couple of tires with one tank filling Okay, let's move on. Um, this is more the commercial type, <clears throat> the the um, the kind of type you would find uh, within a factory for uh, compressing air or pumping air or gases. And and again, the beauty with these systems is you can generate a fairly high pressure, and uh, you can pressurize systems fairly fairly high up. I mean, when you look at car pressure, car tire pressure, it's not that much. It's it's just about two atmospheres, um, and uh, and that's all, so it's not really um, that high pressure. But um, when you look at hydraulic systems, you're looking sometimes at 100, maybe even 400 bar or even more, uh, in like, you know, hundreds of atmospheres uh, than, uh, you know, within a car system. So it's, it's a lot more. And these, these type of pumps are ideal for generating a very high, uh, very high pressure. Okay, I had a look and I was sort of looking around and where else do you find these uh, reciprocating piston type pumps and um, um, and, and these are, um, it's a so-called pump jack and it's um, an overground drive for um, a reciprocating piston pump in an oil well and so sometimes they're used for pumping water, groundwater, um, for irrigation and uh, sometimes they're used for, you know, oil wells, you know, small, you know, to uh, small-scale oil production. Um, I've seen some of them. I know some of them are in North Germany. Uh, there's, Germany has got its own oil fields, but they're not very uh, efficient. It's just like a little bit of oil that is taken out of the ground. Um, the place where I've seen tons of them is America. I've seen loads of them in New Mexico, and they were all over the place. So every farmer seemed to have a, a couple of these. It's a, it's a desert area, so you can't do much with the land out there. And it seems every farmer seems to have a couple of these things uh, in the field and they're just pumping oil out, uh, you know, all day long. They're totally automated units. 
and uh, they're just pumping oil. And the, the, the concept here is just like a, um, a reciprocating piston pump yeah, um, for, for one of these things, for small you know, oil, oil wells. Okay, so then we've got another type of pump. We've got the piston pump and we've got the plunger pump. Yeah? Again, similar concept. Um, you, you see the two valves here. So that's the piston pump and you've got like uh, um, um, your, your valve arrangements here. So it's one suction and one discharge valve and it's the same here as well. But in this instance, we've got a, a plunger pump. Yeah? So instead of a piston that, uh, you know, puts the... Um, um, you know, scrapes up all the, the gases which are on the side of it and pumps them up. In here, we've just got like a, um, a reduction in, um, in area in the chamber. And through this reduction, um, the, the excess gases pump, pumped out or liquid as well, if it, if it is a liquid. Okay, and then you probably have seen these bits here as well. This is sort of the old um, uh, pumps. Um, which were used sort of in medieval days. Uh, you would have seen them in London in um, sort of the 16th, 17th, possibly even up to the 18, 1800s, where uh, people were pumping water, groundwater, for everyday consumption. Okay, again, it's not gases, it's, it's liquids, but it's just sort of getting this concept across of, um, you know, where these pumps come from. And the, these pumps have been around for a long time. Uh, again, just a little bit of information on the side. Um, the uh, pumps for for water, uh, they can pump water to a height of about through suction of, a, of of about ten meters, and that's equivalent to the atmospheric pressure. So the atmospheric pressure through creating a vacuum will push up water up to about ten meters. So that means if you've got a, a, a the groundwater level uh, anywhere above ten meters below the surface. Uh, you can use one of these pumps and through suction, where initially you just uh, suck up gas and uh, or air, and uh, and then the the liquid follows. You can actually lift up water uh, right up to the surface, yeah, providing it's less than ten meters, and and that's equivalent to the atmospheric pressure. So the atmospheric pressure can lift water uh, to to about ten meters in in height. Um, so we've got reciprocating piston type pump uh, the same concept as a displacement pump works as a positive displacement pump can be used for liquids and gases so that's a biggie here you can use them for gases as well they can be used for a wide range of pressures um, they are ideal when there's a need for high and consistent pressure okay so that's really what we use them for which is high and consistent pressure okay uh, let's move on um, we've got a rotary blower pump yeah? so it's just a picture of them, what they look like. Um, a few more pictures. Uh, it's a bit like, let's have a look. Uh, a few more pictures here for the rotary blower pump. Um, I forgot one. Okay, here we've got um, an example. We've, we talked about the vein pump earlier and um, uh, and you can see how the veins work. Yeah? So you've got this chamber and you've got these um, um, veins, yeah, that's what they are. And uh, you've got, they're spring-loaded, so they can push in and out. And then you've got this, um, you know, slightly offset uh, wheel here. And so the veins are pushed around. And as the veins are pushed around, the, the area where the, the gas is um, captured, you know, where, where, it's, where it's in, is getting more and more constricted. And it's going to be forced out the outlet. Yeah. So that's how the, the vein type blower pump works. Uh, we've got the rotary lobe type blower pump. And again, we looked at them before, where you've got these lobes. And um, uh, these lobes are sort of pushing into one another. And with that, they, uh, they generate um, a pressure. So you can, uh, again, they work for fluids and gases. And with this pressure, you can then... Um, you know, pump gases into into a system, and this is what they look like for real. Uh, they're quite when you see them sort of going around. They look quite weird if you've ever opened them up. Um, quick question, um, and probably have to wait for about forty seconds now. Um, has anybody ever worked with these uh, lobe blowers or with these lobe type rotary pumps? Okay, I have to wait now a little bit. 
which means I can have a coffee. I'm just looking at your comments here. Um, a double next week to make up for the missing Whopper Wednesday. The problem is you, you only get, I need to have two phones. It only lets you uh, order one Whopper for two pounds on the, on the Burger King app. Yeah, you only get one. You only get one a day. That's the, uh, that's a problem. Okay, that's interesting. So none of you have ever worked with these uh, lobe blower pumps. Um, never, never, nobody. That's interesting. Um, I've seen them in operation, and it's really weird when those two things, uh, it's, it's high-precision mechanics, when they sort of turn into, into one another. Yeah. So um, it's quite, quite, quite amazing, you know, the amount of engineering that's gone into it. Okay, uh, Joe, you've got him on, on your paster. Um, any comments on uh, Joe on um, on low blower pumps? I mean, have you have you had any issues with them or any problems or other maintenance issues? I mean, what I find find fascinating with them is that it's sort of high precision engineering, so they they just almost scrape the edge of the uh, the casing. And sort of into one another, there's hardly any space between them. I, I would say there's no space between them. They're quite amazing devices when you look at them. Quite amazing pumps. Uh, a lot of engineering that's gone into it. And I sometimes wonder, you know, if, if you heat them up a lot, whether they would still work. Because once they expand the, 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 the clearances between, between the, um, the lobes and the casing are so minute. It's, it's just phenomenal. Uh, Joe, just a question. Any any experience with a maintenance task for them? So now I have to wait for a little bit. Uh, sorry for the silence. It's just to do with the. Um, um, the delay I've got between you. Okay, Joe has written. Uh, the thicker the paste, the better, because if it is slightly too warm, it makes the paste thin, and it slightly and it slightly passes through. Okay, okay. Thanks for that. Thanks for that update and for sharing that. Okay. Right. Okay. I'll I move on. Go to the next slide. Uh, we've got axial flow funds, and and they are quite common. You see them like. Um, uh, for cooling, if you do anything in electronics, um, you see them all over the place. Yeah? They're normally used for cooling. Uh, one of the best manufacturers for them, and it's a, it's a, uh, a company called Pabst, P-A-B-S-T, uh, I think, Pabst, yeah. And, um, and, and the, the thing, what they produce is they, um, they make sure that these funds, they, they last a long time, so the quality is so much better, the bearings are better. So if you buy one of those funds and you put them in um they will last for for 100 years that's that's what they feel like if you buy sort of a lower quality after a couple of years you can hear them screeching and um, they're on the way out they're normally used for cooling components and electronics but obviously they can be used for other stuff as well um so you can see this here there's a picture of an axial flow fund. I'm just going to read this out to you. So they, they date back to the horizontally configured windmills uh, of Europe in the Middle Ages. Uh, the first electrically powered funds were introduced in the 1880s. Um, and these funds were axial funds. Yeah. So 1880s again. So this is when we got all the three-phase motors, when electricity became um, um, more common, yeah, more accessible. Uh, before the 1880s, it's... Um, Electricity was just, uh, you know, something universities were playing about with, but it wasn't really used uh, a great deal. Um, and so then it, it all changed right about that time. Uh, axial funds are named for the direction of airflow they create. Blades rotating around an axis draw air in parallel in, draw air in parallel to that axis and force air out in the same direction. Axi axial funds create airflow with a high flow rate, meaning they create a large volume of funds. Um, they're great for cooling stuff. 
and they are ideal for electronics. You find them in computers, you know, for the CPU to cool them down. Um, you find them in when you've got amplifiers, power amplifiers, um, power supplies. When they start getting a little bit too hot, then you've got these axial fans in there. Um, but uh, they cannot create a lot of pressure and um, they're okay for moving gas. You know, like a box standard fan, um, moving air from A to B, but um, that's, that's pretty much all. Um, we've got uh, axial flow fan, just a, a summary. So we've got low pressure, but they can move a high volume of air, but they can't really generate a lot of pressure. They're good for cooling. They're energy, energy efficient. So we've read this in the text before that um, you uh, don't need a lot of energy to run these things. So they are very low power devices. They don't cost a lot. Uh, they are available for DC and AC applications. Yeah? So you can run them from a battery uh, or from a, you know, a car battery or a DC system. Uh, but they're also available in, in AC as well for AC applications. And um, uh, I've messed about a lot with these funds uh, in, in days gone by. And, um, and there are some funds which are brushless. Yeah? So they don't have a commutator. They just have some magnets in there, some permanent magnets. And, and that's what, they, uh, what they're what used with. And, and they're the ones to go for, especially for AC applications, go for brushless ones, uh, because they will last a lot longer. It's a lot less maintenance, and uh, they will last uh, for years yeah, without you having to worry about anything. There's no change in the direction of airflow. Obviously, the airflow goes just in one, one direction. Okay, next one. Um, you find axial flow funds on car radiators, and just watch the mouse. You've got one near the radiator, so if the car is stationary, and there's not enough air coming through the or getting through the radiator, the fan comes on and um, and then it uh, it blows air through the radiator and the car cools down. Um, what ha used to happen in the past, and it's just a little bit for you guys if you are uh, driving, every now and then, especially when you've got an old car, make sure that this fan actually kicks in, that it works. If it doesn't work, um, and sometimes it happens, it's just a, a little thermostat, and if the temperature in the in the in the radiator gets too hot, the fan comes on. If it doesn't work, what will happen is the engine will heat up more and more and more, and eventually, uh, potentially, it'll blow the gasket, the head gasket, and you're looking at uh, four or five hundred quids, if not even more, um, uh, uh, you know, worth of damage to to try and change the gasket, the head gasket. It's a big job to do it, and I myself, I've had uh, I think one car where this has happened to, and I know a lot of friends who had the same problem. So they were in a traffic jam, you know, warm summer day. Temperature was going up and up and up, yeah, and um, and the fan didn't kick in, and um, and then eventually the gasket went, and it was all down to just a, a, a thermostat that wasn't working or that wasn't working as it was supposed to be. And what you do is you just you know when you get the car every now and then just test it out, you know turn on the engine, let it let it heat up, and uh, wait for the fan to kick in. Yeah, so um, it's, it's important. Um, one instance, I mean, for years I just had old cars. I was so paranoid about this stuff that I just over, over put an override in. So I had like a switch inside the car. So if, if I felt that the temperature was getting too hot, I could just switch it on manually and cool it down. Okay, we've got another fan as well. That's not an axial fan. That's more like a centrifugal fan. Um, and that's used for the hot air inside the, uh, inside the car. Okay, uh, axial flow fan, you can see them in bathrooms and things like that where uh, you've got an extractor fan, so that, that's a typical axial flow fan, and it's used for pumping gases. Yeah. And then we've got radial blowers. That's the next one. So this is what they look like, and um, I think I had you, I'm not sure, but I had you work on the, um, on the radial blower in the, in the factory. Um, if I did, um, you will have seen it, and, and it's just used for blowing air at high speed, and that's uh, that's how they work. Let's have a uh, next one. Okay, that's what they look like. You know, again, look at the uh, the veins you've got. Not the veins. The uh, the um, uh, I'm I'm looking for words now, and I'm I'm missing them. I look at the um, the propeller. Not sure what it is. Anyway, they're slightly different. So this is a radial blower. Yeah. Okay, next one is a centrifugal blower. We had a look at centrifugal pumps before. Uh, we've got one in the um, in the factory, and I'm sure I've introduced you to that one in one stage. 
and uh, anyway that's that's what we have at PMC okay next one is uh, centrifugal funds a little bit of uh, information about them so we've got um, uh, the invention so it's 1832 that's when they were done um, by a Russian general um, they are often called blowers um, the the thing which is interesting about them is that they change the direction of airflow by 90 degrees impeller blades thank you very much Josh thank you um, Again, sorry for the delay, it's uh, 45 seconds or whatever it is, um, with our, but uh, impeller blades. Okay, anyway, centrifugal fans to so come back to uh, uh, the fans here. Um, so we've got a change of direction of 90 degrees. With the axial fan, we don't have any change of direction, unless you put like a pipe in or whatever and you change it from uh, one to the other. But as far as uh, the, um, the, the, the fan itself is concerned, or the, in inverted commas, the pump itself is convert, uh, concerned, there's no change of direction. Now, with the centrifugal fan, you've got a change of direction by 90 degrees you know, for the airflow. And that could be interesting as well. So if you need to, um, you know, take air from somewhere and then blow it into a different direction. Uh, right. Anything else which is interesting in the text? I leave it up for a moment so you can read it. Okay, the airflow created by centrifugal fans is directed through the system of ducts and tubes. Okay, we know this. This helps to create higher pressure airflow than axial fans, and that's maybe an advantage. Again, always bear in mind, when you when we look at food industry, um, also when we look at certain clean environments, they use it for that as well, that um, they sometimes create, um, they blow filtered air into the clean environment, and they put the clean room under higher pressure than the outside environment um, so that uh, no dust is sucked into the room yeah? but that the the higher pressure will move everything to the outside and, and that's uh, what we are using an awful lot within industry food industry as well to work with pressure differentials um, right airflow despite low flow rate and you can create a steadier flow of air than axial fans okay so they can create a steadier flow of air but they require a higher power input. Okay, I'm gonna to move to the next page just to give you some warning in case you're reading the slide. Um, okay, I'm gonna go. Uh, that's what they look like. And that's pretty much what our centrifugal blower looks like um, at the back of PMC. I'm sure I've been working uh, with you on them, I'm not sure. Um, 100%. Okay, centrifugal blowers. It's a mechanical device for moving air and other gases. Other terms are blower or squirrel, squirrel cage fan. Okay, not to be confused with the squirrel cage uh, in a three-phase motor. Uh, these fans increase the speed and volume of an airstream with a rotating impeller. Centrifugal fans use the kinetic energy of the impellers to increase the volume of the airstream. Uh, centrifugal fans displace air radially, changing the direction by 90 degrees. And they are, um, uh, provide constant displacement, they are constant displacement device or constant volume device, meaning that a constant fan speed, a centrifugal fan moves at a relative constant volume of air rather than a constant mass. Yeah. So that means we've got a constant movement of air with these fans. Yeah. Uh, centrifugal fans are not positive displacement devices, yeah. so they are not, but we, we looked at this before. Okay, a um, little bit about uh, advantages and dis disadvantages. Um, they are more efficient, they are more sturdy, um, they are quiet. And, and again, when you go to the PMC and when, the, when I turn the thing on, it's pretty noisy. But if you, if you ever listen to you know, other pumps which are around, they are much more noisy. They generate a lot more noise than uh, centrifugal blowers, especially piston pumps. Yeah? They... Uh, they are uh, they're pretty bad uh, just to give you one example and it's just a little anecdote from home um, I was my brother's got this compressor and um, which is a piston pump piston displacement pump and um, and obviously you know when you've got the cylinder there's always a little bit of leakage in there 
and I was pumping up my car tires, doing some maintenance, pumped up the tires, um, and I forgot to turn the thing off. Yeah. So the way it works is, so it builds up the pressure, and you know, it makes like a right racket, and um, and then um, um, uh, once the pressure is built up, it just stops. Yeah. So nothing, nothing happens, and then it waits until the pressure drops below a certain point. And then the thing goes, you know, turns itself on again to, to build up the pressure in the uh, in the cylinder, um, the, the um, compressed air cylinder. Uh, anyway, what what I'd forgotten is I pumped up my tires and it sort of pumped itself up and it built up the pressure and I totally forgot to, to turn the thing off. And it was outside in, in, a, in a garage within a residential area. And uh, I totally forgot about that thing. And uh, the whole night through, every sort of 20, 30 minutes, the compressor uh, was, was just trying to pump up the air in the cylinder. And it made a right racket. And uh, and anyway, I noticed the next day and I got some really nasty looks from the neighbors uh, who probably were disturbed in their sleep. And it, it was really embarrassing uh, to uh, to deal with that. But, um, but anyway, that's <clears throat> the difference. You know, centrifugal blowers are compared to displacement pumps a lot quieter. Um, and yeah, that's what they are. They're reliable. They're capable of operating over a wide range of conditions, but the capital cost is higher. Why? I don't know. Okay, we've got um, another interesting thing. Um, and what is it? Do you know? Let's see how good you are. What is that thing? What is it called? There's a, there's a name for it. And most, it's obviously it's done in cars, and most cars have got it. High capital costs. It costs a lot to uh, to buy it. Yeah. So the the initial cost of um, buying it is really really high. Uh, so the investment is high. Uh, hey, well done, Aaron. It's a it's a car turbo. That's how a turbo works. So uh, the um, um, the exhaust drives um, effectively just something like a pump, and so um, it's it's almost like a I don't know, like a like a motor, and um, and then you've got an impeller, and this um, um, generates pressure um, for the air, which goes into the intake manifold. Yeah, and so you've got um, uh, you've got your turbo working. Uh, well done, well done. Okay. Anyway, thanks thanks for that. That's good. Uh, right. Anyway, we've got a multi-stage pump. We need to talk about a multi-stage pump. And in this instance, we've got, uh, I think this is a centrifugal multi-stage multi pump. And so you can see we've got like several um, uh, stages to this pump. In this instance, we've got four stages. And uh, with that, you can improve the efficiency and the pressure it can generate. Again, this is just another one, a multi-stage pump. Um, I need to mention it. That's part of the um, the syllabus to to sort of mention it. But in in essence, it's just like several pumps um, put onto one shaft, and um, you with the aim to increase the efficiency and the performance and and everything else that's connected to it. Yeah. So you can create a lot more stuff. So this is what they look like for real. These are multi-stage pumps. So you can see the motor at the back. And then in here you've got your multi-stage pump and you can, um, I'm not sure what it is used for, you can use it for gases and uh, pump gases. Okay, summary of gas pumps. Um, some of them, we've seen them before, some of them are new. So we looked at the, the lobe um, pump. So we've got like a, a, th a three lobe pump and a two lobe pump. We've got the centrifugal pump. We looked at that one. We've got the vein pump. We, we looked at that one before. And this is called the Lissholm screw. I think we had an example before as well for liquids. And then we've got one for axial flow, where you, you've just got your propeller and um, you know the air is pumped through. 
And then we've got a really interesting design, and this is a Wankel um, rotary design. Wankel is a German guy. He designed an engine, and um, uh, the problem was is the engine was going too hot, and it only thrives on high revs. It's very different to a, a normal piston system. And uh, I'm just trying to think. I think it was NSU, an old car, and they used the Wankel engine. And it was sort of really um, efficient, very high performance, but they had a problem and they, they went too hot because they were just going around too fast and the seals were going. Yeah, so they didn't last very long. So you needed every couple of um, tens of thousands of miles, you had to virtually had to rebuild the engine. So they never really took off because people obviously don't want this, but uh, the design is really, really interesting. Uh, there's another manufacturer recently, I don't know who it was, and they, they had another go at the Wankel engine, and uh, it worked really well. Now, this same design can also be used for a pump, you know, this this Wankel design. Yeah. Uh, apologize for the name, but uh, anyway, that's what it is. We've got a scenario here. Um, okay, let you sort of just go through it. What pump do you think would be ideal for this scenario? Uh, I'm just going to read it out to you. It's uh, propane gas is heavier than air and therefore tends to be near the ground. At a petrochemical plant, propane uh, is a byproduct of, of the refining process. Unwanted propane needs to be burned off. To burn off the gases, it needs to be pumped away from the main plant for safety reasons. What type of pump would you recommend and why? Mazda, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, that's for the Wankel engine. Uh, Mazda. Uh, okay, anyway, give it a go. What What do you think and why? Uh, give me an engine and uh, or a pump, not an engine, a pump, and tell me why you would use this pump for this scenario. Okay, I'm just uh, sorry for the silence. I'm just um, waiting for the delay to kick through and to get some, some answers from you guys. Okay, thanks, Jimmy. That's interesting. Um, any comments on the Mazda? Um, did it take off? Are they still around? I know the first ones which came around, it, it was just a massive problem and they uh, didn't make it and a lot of people didn't touch it. Okay, Ryan, thank you for that. You've got um, two answers. One of them piston maybe because the floor can't go back on itself, which is true. It's impossible. So even if the engine stops, or the not the engine, uh, pump, if the, if the pump stops, um, it cannot go back on itself. So it's, it's a strong reason. Reason centrifugal can build up a good pressure to to pump it out. A multi pump, yeah, might be an idea as well. Why Faisal and Sarah? Why do you think centrifugal? Okay, you, you gave the answer. It works for higher pressure. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, okay, centrifugal yeah. for Natasha. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to wait for a moment. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> obviously, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Okay, fine, yeah. 
Good points. Good good points you're making. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there isn't a definitive answer for that. Um, it's just trying to make you think about it. That's that's all. Um, okay, can move it safely from one place to another without contamination. Okay, fair enough. Um, piston pump. You could make an argument. There might be uh, lubricants inside the pump. You know, to make sure that it doesn't um, run dry. Um, since there's no liquid to lubricate it. Um, so there could be some contamination in it. I mean, for gas, if it's just burned off, it probably doesn't matter that much. But uh, when you've got a centrifugal pump, there's no um, um, lubrication within the path of where the gas is flowing. It's a good point. Okay, I'm going to move to the next slide. We've just got a few more slides to go and then we are done here. So we've got an anti-gravity wind tunnel. Uh, what type of pump would you use to generate sufficient pressure for an anti-gravity wind tunnel? I don't know whether you've ever seen them. So if you ever wanted to get the experience of gravity, uh, you've got these tunnels and they put them up and it's just like, literally, it's just like a big tube. They stick you in the tube and um, um, then right at the bottom, there's uh, some sort of grit so you can't drop into um, the mechanics that generate the wind. Otherwise, it would be very, very, very scary. And, and you can have sort of a, a sensation of weightlessness, you know, with the wind carrying you. Um, I've never seen one for real. I've seen some um, uh, video clips of people doing it and I always fancy doing it myself, but I'm not sure whether I'm too heavy for that. But um, here we go. Anyway, um, what type of pump stroke uh, system would you use to generate to generate the wind. <laughs> uh, right, Fash. Um, yeah. Uh, any ideas? Gonna wait a few seconds. Uh, again, apologies for the delay. It's uh, would be nice if it were a little bit more in real time. Uh, yeah, actually, that's all it is. I mean, when we go back, um, let me just show you. I'm just going to go back through the... Uh, thanks, Fash, for that. Um, that's all it is. It's just an axial flower fan they put below. So they've got like a massive grit. You know, like, uh, you know, some steel bar so that you can't fall into the fan. And they've just got this, this massive axial flow fan. And, um, and that blows the air all the way up this tube. Let me just go back. Um, it goes all the way up the tube and then they, they drop you into this tube with uh, you know all the protective gear and you can have a, a sensation of uh, um, of uh, of weightlessness you know um, the pressure this is interesting as well because it's open on the um, on the top a huge amount of airflow to um, to get this guy to flow uh, write this but yeah spot on yeah Exactly, for high volume. We need a high volume of air to come through. Um, right. Um, okay, compare gas pumps to liquid pumps. Um, what are the main issues with, with pumping gases? So that's a question. Uh, how much time have you got? I sort of realized we're getting close to the end. I'm just going to move on. I'm not going to wait. Actually, I thought I had the answers here. I haven't. Okay, let's let's go through it quickly. So we've got gas pumps and liquid pumps, uh, main issues with pumping gases. Um, what would you say are the main issues? I thought I had a few more slides, but I didn't. That's just uh, the one before, before the last. So.
Um, and, and we've got like obviously displacement pumps and we've got centrifugal pumps and we've seen a few more systems to move gases like the axial funds or fund systems. Um, one of them is high pressure, yeah. So we need sometimes to have high pressure. Leaks again is a big issue. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, more for vacuum screen creating gases. Um, expensive probably, yeah. Expensive probably. Um, one of the big problems is whenever you've got a liquid, uh, liquids are, are almost self-sealing. So if you've got like little, little cracks or whatever in displacement pumps. Um, the liquid itself will will help sealing it, but stop from it to get through. When you're dealing with gases, if there's just the tiniest bit of tolerance, um, you you would start having losses, and and gases are getting through. And um, I know you guys are working a lot with pneumatic systems, and I bet you can hear this all the time. Where you've got actuators, where the seals are not sealing properly, and there's sort of constantly this hissing sound of uh, of air escaping, even though the actuator is not moving at all. And um, and that's that's one of the problems when you are dealing with, uh, especially with displacement pumps, that you've got like a little bit of uh, of tolerance in there. Um, what else have we got? High pressure, high volume, yeah, uh, all valid points. Um, anything else for gas? For pumping gases, yeah. Uh, again, a lot of gases like air, they are not, not dangerous. Yeah. But then you've got other gases as well when you look at uh, propane or um, um, gases from within the petrochemical industry, uh, you've, got, you've got quite some problems yeah. um, with uh, them not being, in, um, you know, requiring an intrinsically safe environment so that you now arcing and sparking can, can be happening. Uh, again, we've got three-phase motors, yeah. So um, asynchronous three-phase motors, which don't generate any sparks and arcs in any way whatsoever. Um, pumps normally shouldn't uh, generate any sparks and arcs, but what we, uh, what we get is we've got sometimes metal rubbing on metal and it can create problems. Yeah. Centrifugal pumps, less so. Um, displacement pumps, maybe a little bit. Uh, we've got the problem with lubrication, where we have to have maybe additional lubrication for those pumps to um, um, since there's no liquid there so for example when you've got a, a water pump in your car the antifreeze which you use in your car is meant to lubricate the water pump in the car as well to provide a little bit of lubrication and keeping it going okay that's it i'm going to go to the last slide which it's the last slide it's the the summary um we have looked at um, different pumps for moving gases and we, we, we have had a look at the reciprocating piston pump, the rotary vane type pumps, rotary lobe type pumps, centrifugal blowers, axial radial blowers and multi-stage pumps. Yeah. So, so they are all pumps which we, um, which we use for this, uh, for this purpose and um, um, just use for gas, that's all, just use for gas. Very similar to liquids um, <clears throat> but um, but obviously, different requirements. We need better seals. We need less tolerances to try and keep the gas where, especially for displacement pumps, uh, to to keep the gas where it's supposed to be. <clears throat> especially if the gases, we cannot afford to lose those gases. When you look at pneumatics in general, I'm sure you can see this all over your plants that um, that there's leakage all over the place, and it's a big problem as well. There's a big um, discussion about going on. The amount of energy you lose and uh, you know the the carbon footprint and so on through leaky seals within pneumatic systems okay i'm going to stop at this point and we are we are early we've done it very good time um so um there's not going to be a class tomorrow according to my timetable um i'm supposed to be back on on monday uh, so we can probably finish off this unit on monday um the next question is about the timing is 10.30 a good time for you?
or is it too late or too early? I thought it's just sort of leading you up to lunch. By the time you finish, you can get ready uh, to go for lunch. Um, just some feedback of that. And is two o'clock a good time as well? Just to... Uh, yeah, we can do that. We can do this uh, as well. Thanks, Natasha, for that. Um, I, I didn't have a chance to talk you through, didn't I? So with everything that was going on. So yeah, it's, it's taken on board and we'll do that. 10.30 is brilliant, okay. Uh, what about others? Just I'm just trying to find a consensus to see where, where you are with, with all this. Okay. Okay, that's fine. 2 o'clock as well, I assume. Better than 2.30 because I know some of you finish early. Okay, that's great. Okay, okay. I, I think according to the timetable, we've still got the full week next week. Um, so 3.08 is important because we finished it. Uh, what I'll do is I'll finish off this unit and then maybe we'll spend some time to go through uh, 3.08. Um, and then um, uh, we're going to move on to 3.15. Yeah, that's, that's all about three-phase motors. Yeah. That might be, might be an idea to do this. Okay, right, I <clears throat> get the impression the consensus is that 10.30 and 2 o'clock are good times. Uh, I'm just reading everything, yeah, that, that seems to be okay. So let's stick with those times, and uh, as usual, I, I try and send you, I, I always get like a different, obviously a different link for each time when I, when I do this uh, task. So I'm going to email you the link, and uh, um, it seems to go through okay. I think everybody, almost everybody is here. Don't know who's missing, but I think it's one person is missing looking at the numbers here. Um, but um, please, you know, tell your colleagues as well, you know, especially if somebody, if I've missed somebody and uh, email me as well. I can still access emails. Today it conked out at one instance. Couldn't access my email, my, my stuff email, but uh, I can do it most of the time. And um, then I'll, I'll inform you about the link. And if you can't get the link, um, actually, I'm going to send you the an email today with the links for the presentations and also um, a URL for the channel. So if you ever miss the link, all you need to do is go to the channel, click on videos. And then if there's a live session on, you should be able to just go in without knowing the link. That might be an idea as well. Okay, guys, I, I wish you a really good weekend. I hope you get uh, lots of uh, toilet rolls and uh, whoppers. And uh, Tom, right. Have you got, Joe, have you got Tom's email? Can you just let me have it here and then um, I can just add it to, to my list. Thanks for highlighting that. Okay, Josh, that's that's okay. Good idea. Just search for the YouTube channel. Um, I think it's under my name, Michael Trombone, so it should be there. Uh, yeah, Fash, you too. Have a good good equ uh, good good weekend. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll I'll be hitting the shops uh, a little bit more to do. Uh, Stocking up on a little bit more food, not not go crazy, but just a little bit more, and then um, I think I'll be done for this weekend as well. I'll see you on Monday. Uh, yeah, you too, Natasha. Thank you. Have a great weekend, uh, and and Aaron, Joe, Joe. Have you got Tom's email? All right. Thank you, Sarah. Same to you. You know, have a have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy. Okay. Bye, Fash. Bye, Rana. Uh, you too, uh, Jimmy. Have a great weekend. So thanks. I'll see you, Riley. Yeah, I will. I will try and take it steady. <laughs> okay.
Okay, um, Joe, uh, if you can, if you can ask Tom to just email me, yeah. So um, and then um, uh, it should be should be fine. I've got an email list here, which um, just like one five, I've got all the emails in. If I add them to to the email, then whenever I send something out, it's gonna get to him as well. I'm not sure why why it's not on the list, or must must be my mistake. I've maybe not copied it or forgotten it or whatever. Uh, yeah, thanks, Daisy. Bye. Uh, have a great weekend as well. Enjoy. Okay, I'm just going to write it down so it's Okay, um, Joe, thank you very much for the uh, for the email update. I've got it, and I'll, I'll put it up. Okay, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Okay, guys, so see you next week, okay? I'll uh, end the stream, and um, uh, the video should go live. Uh, the, the chat shouldn't be available, so everything you've said in here is, uh, should be confidential. Uh, so that's okay. Right, uh, I'll uh, I'll sign out. I'll I'll end the stream at this stage. Okay, uh, have a great week and see you on Monday.